Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to Friday's edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by the good people at Options House. Uh, Cranky Joe Young, how you doing this morning? Pretty good, Joel. You know, we're spiking back up into the low 20s outside oh. today, which actually, I had the window cracked on my way into work and it felt warm. Does that sound strange to you? Because it, it was strange to me to see that it's, you know, 20 degrees outside and feels like a heat wave. <laughs> well, it's uh, when I wake up in the morning, I check the weather. I'm like, oh, it's 25 today. I don't have to wear my winter coat. I can wear something <laughs> a little bit lighter. But uh, Joe, what do we got on the docket for today? Well, today, Joel, as usual, very exciting show. It's Friday. So it's Joe Gitz, Friday, CEO and founder at Social Market Analytics. He'll be discussing this week's market sentiment from the pre-market edge report. We also have Brian Shannon, who is a CMT. Is CMT a certified market technician or is it a cranky market technician? Uh, I think it's a certified, certified market, market technician. technician. Yeah. And he's also the founder of Alpha Trends. So that's at Alpha Trends on Twitter. He'll be on about 9 a.m. Eastern time. And that's what we've got going on today. It's also Friday the 14th, so it's Funky Friday here on the news desk. We already had our little uh, jam session this morning, although Kurt apparently isn't a funk fan, so he might not last here very long. <laughs> yeah, I came in this morning and I was greeted with uh, Soul Train, which is uh, – a great TV show, what, from the 70s, late 60s, well, early 70s? Brent here? has the 411 on Soul Train because he's a huge fan. And I believe Soul Train ran into the 80s. Isn't that right, Brent? Can I get a nod or oh, something? Oh, yeah, like three decades. Who was three? the host of that? Who was the guy? None other than Don Cornelius. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. What a great show. I don't know if anyone remembers that in the chat room. I remember Soul Train. <laughs> Soul Train. So, remember Dennis, you remember Soul Train? Train that started? So, it's definitely in the 80s because I can remember it. Dennis, you remember Soul Train, but you don't remember the Ford Pinto fiasco in the late 70s? Mm, no, I don't remember the Ford Pinto fiasco. I missed that one. But GM's trying to copy it, are they? Well, not necessarily try to copy it, but basically a little history on the Ford Pinto. Ford decided when they were manufacturing the Pinto, one of the best selling cars in its history, that they could save $11 per vehicle by not installing these brackets around the fuel tank. <laughs> and that, so what, what would happen was that if someone rear ended a Ford Pinto, the gas tank would come dislodged and it would set the car on fire and kill everybody inside. And it was, you know, really great and everything. But if they saved $11 instead by not putting these brackets in the vehicle, it would actually cost them less money to pay out all of the lawsuit fees for people that had died. And wow. there's, a, there's a term for it. I'm blanking on it right now. Um, Stupidity? No, no. It's a, like a certain type of accounting or something like that. When you're taking, when you're factoring in the future cost of, of deaths, of deaths and, <laughs> and payouts from legal fees <laughs> versus the horrible. upfront cost saving money on manufacturing. Wow, that is horrible. Wow, we hope GM wasn't doing that. So on that accounting anyways. But Although I don't want to say like been... maybe we should pardon GM because that was an era of really crappy vehicles for them. So, you know, pre-2008, we should just basically forgive all uh, all of their errors. Shareholders are not forgiving yeah. any of the GM errors here right now. This stock has just been absolutely massacred the last four days now here. Trading up at 38, put the triple top in, and then four days down in a row here. It's down again this morning. Brent, are you there? What is there? Is there more breaking news here on GM again? Because we're trading lower here once again. Um, so last night there was some details. Actually, throughout the day yesterday there were some details. There will be uh, GM will be providing a recall service notice to uh, notice to all. GM dealers around April 7th. Not sure exactly what that's going to say, but you will get a little bit more details. And then uh, just before the close yesterday, we heard that Senator McCaskill will be chairing the recall hearing, which will happen in April. So uh, more of that uh, finger pointing down there in D.C. coming on GM. And then there was late last night a New York Times report kind of getting into something else besides the ignition switch concern apparently an airbag uh, a review of airbag failures showed that 300 over 300 front seat occupants had died when airbags were not deployed this is something that um, sources are kind of digging into a little bit more as this ignition switch recall is happening and they're kind of finding some other things so that is definitely not uh, something good for GM right now 
Is uh, this another debacle like the Toyota gas uh, pedal? Remember the Toyota gas pedal thing? When was that? Like two years ago when the gas um, pedal was sticking and people were dying? Was, yeah, that was probably more like four or five years ago now, I think. I'm just trying to look back to the charts to see if I see the significant sell-off area on Toyota because that was the last time we really had auto an automaker in trouble because of people obviously dying here because of defects in cars. Um, Joel, do you remember that? Uh, I it 2011? Do, yeah, I, I, do, I don't remember. I'm just trying to uh, take a look at this uh, GM chart here. And uh, that initial news that came out after the close took us down to 33.20, uh, getting a little reprieve here in the pre-market, bouncing up to 33.80. So those are a couple of your early parameters. Uh, just, you know, going to the dailies and looking at the dailies for our traders, just, uh, you know, a scenario where you had um, a level holding up this 34.37 had held up uh, in, what would that be, uh, Wednesday session, and that coincided with a prior low, actually a, a multi-week low at 34.36. Uh, when you took that out, that's really when you got the downside action through that level. We are substantially below that level, so I'm gonna and also the close at 34.09. So really, gotta you know if you're trying to buy this thing and you want to maybe buy it on strength here, let's see if we can get back over that old low at um, at 34.37. And uh, just going on the charts here, it's just longer term. It's just not real pretty here, Dennis. No, uh, no. No, I, I just I, I can't find support in this thing. I don't like the long-term chart at all. Go to the monthlies and what you can see here, and obviously this is fundamental news driving it down now, so it's not really the technicals, but I see a big-time head and shoulders here. When you look from, say, May or, or yeah, I'm looking about June actually to October of 2013, you got the left shoulder. Then you had the run-up over 40, end of the year run-up, and then you know selling off at the beginning of the year. And then the last month, we kind of formed the right shoulder, and now we're starting to break down here again. So... That is definitely a big time head and shoulders pattern forming. I still think you got to be a seller of rallies on here as opposed to picking bottoms. And I think if you're trying to pick bottoms, there's too many unknowns right now. I mean, new news is breaking here every day. We don't really know how, you know, if there's going to be more recalls. We don't know enough information yet to make technical trading decisions really on this. So I'm hands off. This is one of those, like you were saying, SOH, sit on hands, wait for the dust to settle. And then obviously wait for it to put in some maybe you know a couple of double bottom or triple bottom or something like that, and maybe start climbing because I think if you're picking bottoms here, you still might be early. And I guess when we get to situation, we you know where stocks kind of break in uncharted waters. You can see really not much between 34 and 32. I guess the only other you know tip that we would give our traders is you know maybe look for an institutional bid somewhere. You know 33, I guess 33 and a half. That's a little bit close. That might get taken out. But who knows if there's a couple hundred, you know, thousand standing at the point at 33, you know, that might be something that you may want to, you know, be cognizant of and, you know, to cover short because there is going to be some short covering here. I mean, we we have oh, come yeah. down nearly five dollars uh, just from a few trading sessions ago. We're kind of on an Exxon Mobil like streak here, right? When uh, one, two, three, four. Five down days in a row. Remember that when Exxon, Exxon Mobil, Mobil had 21 out of 22. So we're not quite on the Exxon no. Mobil streak yet. But <laughs> but uh, we're starting a streak there on GM. I think eventually it will get a bounce. And like you said, maybe some shorts covering to give it a relief rally. But I think that's all it would be is a little bit of a relief rally. I just don't think we're near the you bottom. You know what, yet. Dennis, before we move off this, you know, and I was going to mention this. I just didn't know about the credibility of it. But uh SF Bright TG's men, you know, mentioned here that the government has identified GM from previous actions when they created the new company. You know, I have, so, I have no idea on that. If yeah, that's the case I, I heard not. that. Too. Do you remember something like that? I, I heard that. I, Brent, did you do you remember hearing that at all? As far as the company being indemnified from the, um, I mean, that sounds familiar. I couldn't confirm it though for like with a headline. Yeah, it no, sounds sounds familiar though. It is. I mean, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, definitely, SF Bright TG. We'll just call you TG from now on. Uh, Actually, it's SF Bright G, isn't it? Bright G. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll just call you G then. Okay, correcting me again. Right. I guess you just couldn't wait. 
I have to no, buy you a nice like dinner that. last night. Okay, we'll move on from GM here. But yeah, but the chart, I don't know. I don't like the chart. I think it looks ugly here. I think you got to get that overall feel. Like when I'm trading a stock, I always want to look at, we were talking about this in Oakland University last night. You want to look at different time frames and you want to look, you know, what's happened recently. But when you go out to the weeklies or the monthlies, you kind of get a feel for overall what's happening too. And if you're just looking at this on a daily, um, you don't really see that head and shoulders pattern that we're talking about. But when you go out to the weeklies, that uh, chart you're looking at right now, it kind ju of jumps right out at you. So you always want to get an overall feel for what the overall m big trend is in this stock. And if you've got significant patterns forming and stuff, and we're, like we said, we're not huge pattern traders. But when they jump out uh, like the, like a sore thumb there, you got to recognize them. You know a lot of other people are looking at the same pattern. So sometimes it can become like self-fulfilling that when you see a pattern like that, it becomes the stock becomes weaker. Uh, let's talk about the overall markets here, though, Joel, because we missed that when we started the show. We are trading down another buck and a half here. Sneaky sell-off yesterday. I, I don't think a lot of people really saw this one coming. Obviously, they're blaming Ukraine. I mean, they blame Ukraine for everything. They are saying that Russia uh, invasion threats are starting to escalate here. So in Crimea River, like Brent was saying, for me to remember how to pronounce it, in Crimea, uh, there's some issues over there again, and it was really whacking the market yesterday. Yeah, also, uh, we were talking last night at dinner about the rollover, uh, where you are now switching contracts from the March to the June. So in order for people that are long the March contracts, they have to sell the March and buy the June. Uh, the spread is very regulated, and it's very you know kept in, in, in line by arbitrageurs and whatnot. But let's just start keeping an eye on that. We'll call it Wacky Wednesday. And that's going to be the Wednesday when the, when the, the contract, or excuse me, yeah, well, actually it was Thursday. We can make up a different name. But on the Thursday after the roll, when the contract rolls over, sometimes you see some un unusual moves. And uh, the market opened higher. You know, everyone, hey, the water's fine. And then we just kind of sold off steadily. Uh, we haven't quite taken out yesterday's low. So I'm going to use that as a support point. 1834.50. Uh, once you get below that, though, Dennis, it'll, I have to be honest to you, it opens up to 1825 and a quarter. You don't like that 1830 area? Is that wasn't that a pretty decent support area there too, Joel? Like multiple times, or when you when you adjust it for the contract, yeah, that becomes 1825. Yeah, yeah, you got to go to the new contract. Yeah. Yeah. So when you become on the on the June, then you're looking at that 1825 area. So there is some support below about 12, 13 points below where we're at right now. If you do get a follow through sell off. And maybe some shorts, you know, might bring in some of the profits there if they were shorting this from a couple of days ago. So I guess that's the first area that we would look at as at a potential bounce area. But I think it was a little bit, you know, like we've been saying, the buy the dippers been coming, the buy the dippers have been coming in. Maybe they come in here again, but there's a few people that are a little more cautious this time because this is the second sell off that we've had on Ukraine now. Um, we had the first sell off, and the buy the dippers came and back and bought it all the way back up to the highs almost. Now we're coming back and retesting the area that we came down to originally. So it's important for the bulls that that area does hold that Joel's talking about, that whole 1825 area. On a final uh, note, one final note on that. Nick mentioned uh, when we talked to him on Tuesday, you know, we were having the rally, but he was kind of looking at it to fade. I mean, because a lot of times when you have, you know, international situations going on, oh, on Friday, sometimes people are just like, hey, they have no control what's going to happen over the weekend, right? And Sunday night, the spoos open up. I mean, if Russia, you know, sends a couple thousand troops into there, there's nothing you can do. You're locked in. I mean, the, and that is going to hit the market. So uh, just a good call by Nick there, just kind of looking for people. Just, you know, Friday sometimes people are a little bit nervous, taking some chips off ahead of the weekend. Talk about what's breaking out is defense had been breaking out a little bit and gold rallied again yesterday it's trading up another three dollars here today uh, my buddy chris banny was texting me yesterday he's like look at this gdx chart look at the miners there that thing was breaking out there yesterday as well on the chart looks like that gdx wants to go higher and that is a breakout and i mean like we've been saying gold was rallying when the market was going higher and if ever there were some concerns gold could continue to go higher and that's exactly what's happening and some of the minor stocks are starting to break out to new um, at least monthly highs here and the overall gold continues to move higher did you bail on that newmont that you had i've still got some i i sold half i sold half i bought it at, and that was an investment for my portfolio i wish i wouldn't have sold any actually but well after i bought it literally they like warned the next day i was like i had the worst timing on that thing ever i bought it like 2380 
I, I think I actually went up to like 25 and I was up slightly in it for a bet. But uh, a week later, then they warned and the stock went all the way down to me on 2078. So I was like, when it came back five days later to my scratch price, I was like, that's a whole loss aversion thing we were talking about last night. I guess I had it a little bit myself there. I did take off half the position, held half, and I'm, I'm, I'm intending on holding half. But I tell you, the Newmont charts, uh, there's some resistance in here, but it's looking a lot better. Uh, just a gold contract. We have taken out yesterday's high at thirteen seventy-five seventy. We've hit seventy-seven even, so can't really call the double top yet. When I'm looking at the charts, though, I mean, you just gotta think maybe they're gonna run it up to that whole number fourteen hundred there. Nice round number, uh, especially if something you know happens over the weekend in the Ukraine. Uh, just real quickly uh, on that uh, Newmont, you are correct. We are coming up to a really really critical level here i know jared i don't think jared's in this morning but i know he got he got caught in that earnings play as well as you did on, on the dip and that actually turned out to be a great buying opportunity yeah you can see you know you just got to be able to you know take the news and look at it both ways but uh you are coming up on an important level 24 uh tw excuse me 25 65 uh, was the high back in January. You got up to 25.53 yesterday. Traded down a few cents here, but uh, definitely take uh, you know take a good look at that resistance there in Newmont. And look at a few of these other ones. Like look at this Gold Corp chart. GG. That was a complete breakout yesterday. This 28 dollar level on double G had been absolutely enormous. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times we had basically tried to break out through 28. Finally broke out through it yesterday. And we know what they say, old support can become, or old resistance can become new support. So if we do go to pull back, um, I think they're going to line up in the lower 28s to buy this thing. I don't know if you're going to get that chance, though. This could just be one of those uh, breakouts that doesn't give you a chance to buy it. But what do you think of that breakout, Joel? Um, I still think these puppies are uh, trailing the bullion by quite a bit. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, they're starting to recover, but I think on a percentage basis, I don't have my calculator in front of me, uh, but, uh, you know, they are, they broke out above 28 here. Uh, the next major resistance point, I don't want to get carried away here. Well, 28.68 was yesterday's high, and uh, going back in September, this thing traded up to 30.32. Uh, before we get off this whole subject, though, what is wrong with silver? What is going on with the silver contract? I mean, shouldn't these things trade together? Or, they used to, anyways. Yeah, look Dude. at this thing. It's dead. It's just kind of been sitting out and hanging out. You're right. Like, when you look at it and contrasting to where gold has moved, gold has been marching straight up. And if you look at silver for really the last, uh, well, three months, we've, we're up a little bit. But the last month, we've gone absolutely nowhere. Maybe it's just digest and the move from the last three months when we were down at 18 and a half up to 21 sitting here digesting if we could get above that 2120 area it would open up too but i don't know you're right like with gold moving up and this not moving up it has definitely got to be a little bit of a concern if you like the silver i could tell you why the silver is not moving up why because i got like a boatload of silver coins that i wanted to sell when it went to 50 and i said nah nah you know i don't want to pick a top here it might go to 100 and it went to 20, so I'm waiting for it to get back up to it. So I'm like, all right, gold's rallying. Here comes the silver. But now it's still lagging. I'm also looking at this $22 level. So this is a different dynamic there. Uh, so maybe it will pick up or, you know, just uh, – just did, did I ever tell you about uh, my buddy? Uh, he's uh, He was an investment advisor over um, at a Canadian bank, and I won't say who he is or anything like that because I don't know if he's supposed to tell information like that. But he didn't say specifics, but he was just saying he had this client come in uh, this was back, uh, if you go back on the silver charts, to when silver was up at like $48. And a little, little, little lady like from Pasadena, like you always say, comes into his office and she says, my son just made 50% in silver and I need you to put all of my money in silver. And my buddy's advising, oh, you never want, you want diversification. He's trying to talk her for literally an hour, trying to talk her out of buying silver as the silver had already run from like 24 to 48 he's, you know he's trying trying nope she sticks to it sticks to it sticks to it says nope i've got to get in i got to get in this silver my son just made all this money put all my money in silver buys it all at 47 bucks oh, and man. literally three days later look what happens it's down at 32 dollars that's your classic uh you know retail trader chasing and hearing you know i've got to be in this thing and that's how bubbles are created and it really was we had the silver run 
from $16 in 2010 to 2011, all the way up to that 47 and then boom, it fell 30% in three days, and that was at the exact top. Well, let me know when she sells. <laughs> I know. That's what we need to know is when she sells, because that's when we need to come in here and buy silver. But that's what happens when you go to Chase, like we saw it with the Ballard Powers and the plugs there the other day. Um and, you know, it can get ugly. Like, these bull runs can go on for a long time, so it's definitely difficult to pick the top and short these things. But when you're chasing, when you're seeing stocks or individual securities, like, let's going back to the plug again, because it's got a couple downgrades here on it, so we're going to talk about it anyways. But when you see a stock go from literally early at the beginning of the year, when it's a dollar, a dollar sixty, and two months later it goes to eleven. That's just an unsustainable run, and it's going to eventually end badly. The problem is it was probably unsustainable at 7 or 8 bucks, and you might have been early shorting it, and then you're significantly underwater. So it's so hard to buy the things or to short the things when they're going straight up. You've almost got to wait for you know, some type of event. Obviously, we had the whole Citron thing that really knocked it down, but uh, Plug Power has bounced back a little bit off those lows. So it's just been violent trading here really since uh, the earnings report. You do have a couple downgrades. Brent, you were uh, joking on the count, I think, downgrade here today. What's uh, the story there? Um, it was it was actually the Roth Capital downgrade. So he downgraded it from buy to neutral and get this, raised his price target to eight bucks. He had an eighty cent price target on it. So he raised it about <laughs> So so he's downgrading it, but he's raising his price target yep. from eighty cents to eight dollars. That's right. We always talk how these analysts just chase the price. Ah. There you go. They're yep. chasing it again. So at the end of the year, he'll look like, oh, this guy was right on the money. The thing was at eight bucks, but he had an eighty cent price target. So yeah, the, the count. The count analyst did a a finer job. He downgraded from outperform to market perform, and also raised his price target, but a little bit more manageable there from five fifty to seven fifty. So, eh. Look how kinda, smart kinda that guy chasing. is. It's at seven fifty nine right now. Wow, he really he, knew what he was he doing. He hit it on the nose. <laughs> Wow, those guys are good. Well, you know what? I'm kind of, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm kind of kicking myself here because I didn't do the exact math for our traders yesterday, and I hope I didn't cost anybody any money. But uh, Dennis, when I see a big move from 1172 down to 532 in a couple days, what is the if it starts to rebound? What's the first thing I look at? You always look for the 50 percent. Okay, and look at yesterday's high. Yesterday's high, 848. Okay. Guess what the 50% retracement is? Mm, 848? 850. Wow. Yeah. Wow, Joel. Those fibs, the 50%. That, we're, we're not big fibs fan, but that 50% sometimes does come in handy. So when you get a, rice, a nice round number on the Fibonacci, is that like even a stronger signal? Yeah, I was okay. just, yeah, and, and I was just going to mention that because, because of it being 850, you know, people, you know, who knows if there was an institutional order there. I wasn't looking at the book when it came up there. But, you know, the longer term traders and anybody that got caught in that downdraft, you know, they're going to be hanging out at 849, 848, 847, 846, 845, 844, you know, layering things up, you know, five, depending on the size of the position. So longer term, that's my number on this. I'm, I'm looking at that 850 as a major resistance, not looking for plug to go higher until we can, you know, go above and close that. If anybody else in the room is trading plug fuel cell, uh, the other who's the other hot rod there, uh, Ballard, take yeah. a look at that fifty percent retracement. Jot that down on your blotter. There, it's a long. -term What's the run. math, Joel? Can you do the error yeah. math on it? Eight thirty-eight was the high on Ballard BLDP. The lowest four sixteen. Eight thirty-eight so minus eight thirty-eight minus four sixteen. Four twenty-two. No, just kidding. <laughs> and uh, what you say the low was? Four sixteen. Okay. All so right. my quick air mass is four bucks. So it says it should rally about two bucks off of that. Yep. Uh, uh, for fuel cell, it is, uh, or that's Ballard, right? Be yeah. Ballard. So it looks like it almost got there. What was it? Six twenty-seven. Six thirty-nine, the high yesterday. So before it started reversing a little bit. So hmm, those fifty percent seem to uh, be working in that play yeah. there. Yeah. You guys. Keep so it. okay. It goes to the 50%. Then you're looking at that, you know, to completely reverse from there or just to pause at that point. What do you think the play I, is? I look at it, I mean, the way these things plunge and stuff, I look at that as major resistance. And, uh, okay, you know, they'll and, line up there yep, for a bit. I think they'll line up there for a while. I think even, you know, they'll go up and, you know, test it. Test it at the first time of pullback, perhaps go up there again. 
these things are eventually going to have to consolidate after co that kind of move, and uh, it could just, you know, do the teaser between, you know, 820, 830, 840, 850, 860 for a few days. But, uh, you know, I'm looking at the plug now. But uh, not putting my bullish cap on plug until we get above that 850 level, close above there. Uh, and we'll see what happens. But just, you know, the short-term trade for yesterday turned out to be a good number. We're coming out of earnings season here. Actually, I guess we've probably been out of earnings season here for a little bit. There's still a few companies reporting. Aeropostale, A-R-O, reported hey, there. Was that uh, this morning, Brett, Aeropostale? Or was that, that last night? That was last night. Okay, so Aeropostale, allowed to take off. We took off early last night. We had that lecture. But Aeropostale is trading down significantly, and I mean significantly here, in the pre-market it's trading 612 right now. Went out at 730. They missed on the top. They missed on the bottom. Jeffries lowering the price target to six bucks. It looks like Jeffries might be right today because this thing's trading at six dollars and 13 cents right now. Kind of a nasty looking chart here in the pre-market. Got the immediate drop, and now you're hanging out at the six buck level, six ten pre-market low. Uh, now you go on the dailies here. You go back to. February 14th, and you made a 604 low. Use it as a place to cover short. I don't know if I'm going long here ever in this thing, but. Uh, I'm never going long, Aeropostale. I'm not a fan whatsoever. Or American Eagle Outfitters, I know, but I just don't like either of those. I, I'm not, I don't know. It's the teeny bopper clothes and stuff. You go in those stores and. I go in there, nothing fits me. They it's wouldn't like, want they you to like say that. and medium shirts and everything. They don't even have extra large of anything, so <laughs> nothing fits me. So I think maybe that's why I'm disgusted with this stuff. If I went in there and tried on a pair of jeans, none would fit me. So is it? Is like, they sell? Bad. They sell guy stuff? Yeah, yeah these stores yeah. sell, uh, sell guys. Uh, I don't even stuff. know. I mean, they've. You know, if they're not if they're not Levi's, then you know, then I'm not wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> Levi's, yeah. Joel. Does anybody still wear those? Joel's still living in the '70s. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got my bell, soul train. I got my yeah, I got my bell bottoms on and my platform shoes. Joel. Yeah, exactly. Hey, it's Soul Train Day. <laughs> <laughs> soul Train Day. You shop there, Brent? You got like American or uh, Aeropostale? style? <laughs> nah, I don't. But I was. I Where was, do you shop, Brent? I, I shop online. He's an online yeah. shopper. No, actually, I I thrift store shop quite often. Yes, Salvation Army. <laughs> okay, all right. So I was I was just gonna say on the Aeropostel, the Q1 guidance was really the bad part. They are expecting a Q1 operating loss in the range of 70 to 75 cents. I'm looking at a street estimate around a 25 cent per share loss. So losing more money and burning more cash doesn't sound like the recipe for a good investment, at least not right now. But I guess if you stay above six bucks and if you like picking bottoms, there is some support at six. Okay. And what Taylor, else? Joel, do you shop at Ann Taylor? Uh, what's isn't there a fancy part of Ann Taylor? Little, the loft isn't the loft. Yeah, isn't? yeah. I've been in there with Lisa a few times. She's bought a few things there. Stocks trading down in the pre-market. Actually, it's trading flat right now in the pre-market. So I guess I'm lying. 34.88 went out at 34.87. They're trying to digest this morning's earnings report. 10 cents versus 7 cents. So that's a slight beat on the bottom line. Kind of in line on the top line, 623.3 million versus 623.8 million. It's sitting here kind of just hanging out right now. I tell you, the spread is very wide, though. Nobody's willing to put an offer out on this thing. The best offer is up at 39 bucks right now. Really? 34.87, but 34 is the best bid. So it's a nice, tidy five point spread here in the pre market. So nobody's uh, jumping in here to make quick markets in Ian Taylor. What I, when I see something like that, not much activity uh, in the uh, after hours of pre-market, I just kind of like to use the close as a barometer. Uh, 34.87 had a 35.18 high. Uh, obviously, some people took some profits ahead of the, uh, ahead of the earnings. Uh, major resistance at the 36.58, 36.50 level. What I'm not liking about the low from yesterday at 34.49, it's just really not much under there until you get to the uh, the double bottom at the 33.96 and 34 level. So if you are playing this uh, th from the long side, cuts through yesterday's low, you may want to have an alternative plan. Somebody's getting itchy. The thousand share bidder at 34 just went to 34.80. How can you tell it's the same guy with a bid on the same exchange? And usually when you see 10 move and then I see it cancel and the best was down 32.60 and then it came back in at 34.80. Somebody's probably short this thing and they're itching a little bit here. Interesting, you know, when you get somebody really, you know, excited there in the pre-market. So keep an eye on that thousand. Maybe he's going to pay up more here on that 34.80. Okay. 
What GIS General Mills is trading significantly lower. They warned on Q3 they're seeing 61 to 62 cents against analyst estimates of 68 cents. But they did a reaffirm the full year guidance. They still say they're going to make the 287 to 290 with the analyst estimates of 288. Doesn't matter. They're taking it out and they're beating it this morning. The General Mills down a buck and a half. And that is a big move for a food stock. Uh, definitely. Uh, 49.36 is what we just hit in the pre-market trading. 3,000 shares, 3,300 shares traded at that in the last bracket. Not a lot of activity. Uh, boy, Dennis, I don't know. I see, I see some lows in that lower 49s here. 49.18, 49.21, 49.49. You gonna you gonna wait for the open on this one, or are you gonna try and pick some up in the pre-market? Uh, just thinking that you know there's gonna be some bidders here through the 51 handle and part of the you know uh, excuse me part in the 50 handle and at that support. Uh, are you gonna wait for the open? I like the support area. I don't think I'm gonna nibble in the pre-market though. I'm gonna digest a little bit. Uh, it, the problem is if you get through that area, then there's not much else. But I do see the lows you're talking about, one, two, three, four. It looks like five, six lows in the whole lower to mid-49. So you got to think if you're short this thing, you probably bring some in there. And, I mean, defensive stocks have kind of been coming into play a little bit here, too, with the recent sell-off. Although when you're worn on earnings, I don't think anybody really wants to jump into those plays. But like you were saying, I think you wrote that article yesterday there. Some of these stocks, and they did give it back later in the day, but we saw Procter & Gamble trading higher for a lot of yesterday. It really wasn't that weak considering how much the market was down. We saw stocks like Colgate, Palmolive, CLX, some of your other food stocks, some of your tobacco stocks. Philip Morris was trading higher for much of the day. So the market was playing defense a bit. GIS is definitely a defensive stock. But that being said, when they're coming out and warning on next quarter, I don't know if everybody's going to jump right in. So I'm going to sit back on this one, let it digest, see where it opens. You can hold above the whole $49 area. Maybe it can get a bounce. But um, and, and like we were saying, it's a big move for a food stock. So I'm definitely not coming out here shorting it right now. Uh, look at this, too. I also, when I see a kind of a move like this, I mean, you are trading down a buck sixty-five on relatively no volume. This stock, it's already exceeded its average daily range by quite a bit. Uh, had less than a buck range yesterday, day before, right around a buck. Uh, you go to Tuesday, it had a 44 cent range. Monday had a 50 cent range. So a lot of times, you know, I look at it as that, you know, the you know the standard deviations. It's already moved its average daily range yeah, already on no mm -hmm. volume. So just. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was a math and magician, I would be able to figure out the probability of it, you know, rebounding. But that that's one thing. I would not be shorting it at this level. Um, see if the support holds. I think you're going to get some kind of bounce. Uh, nowhere near back up to yesterday's low at uh, 50.79. Actually, it was kind of nice because you had three lows in a row, 40, 50, 40, 50, 55, and 50.79. That would have been a f fun bid to whack during the regular session but that's not the case now that will act as major resistance hey gentlemen we did just dip down to 1834 on the s&p futures we did just get some ppi data out february ppi base minus 0.1 percent economists were looking for a gain of 0.2 percent the core month over month figure down 0.2 percent economists looking for a 0.1 percent gain and then the year over year figures ppi base up 0.9% economists were looking for a 1.2% gain. The core PPI year-over-year -year figure up 1.1%. Economists were looking for 1.4%. little worse than expected, and we did just break below 18.34. Danger Will Robinson. We have taken out yesterday's low at 18.34.50. Currently trading 18.33.50. I like to say there's support ahead of the 1725 and a quarter, but I'd be telling a lie, and I don't want to do that. Joe Gitz is in the chat there. We'll have to. We're going to get him on the show in just about a minute here. Right now, we'll have to talk a little bit of what he's seeing on some of the big Momo stocks because a lot of those were leading the charge down there yesterday. You saw Facebook giving back a couple of dollars. You saw Google going below 1200 again. You saw a lot of stocks there looking really weak. Even Netflix was breaking down there yesterday. So let's go grab Joe Getz and uh, get his thoughts and see what the social sentiment's saying and if we're going to get a bounce here today or if this rally or this sell off is going to continue. Okay, we'll be right back.
Welcome back, traders and investors. One of our favorite segments, Joe Gibbs, CEO and founder at Social Media Analytics. Joe will be discussing this week's market sentiment from the pre-market edge report. Joe, you've been hopping in the chat room already. What do you have on the radar? Hey, good morning, guys. Before we get going, hey, thanks for having me on. I enjoy being on your show every week. Uh, it's one of the one of my funnest times. Before, before I jump right in, uh, for those of you who haven't been listening in the past, uh, we aggregate social media, and it's no secret that social media is moving the, moving the news. We've been selling this for the hedge funds for a couple of years now, and you know, we really felt that the active trader deserves to have the same information. And so we've got a whole series of, a whole series of reports and interfaces for you guys. So let's jump in and see what's happening today. It's a good social media day. We've got a lot of volume going on, and there, there's some action in the big names that we talk about. Okay. So let's, let's do talk. it. So you guys want to start? Go ahead. Yeah, go to the top ten. Don't you usually do the top ten there? Or All what right. Do you see are really popping. So, so we've got a, a couple of interesting, a couple of interesting names on, on the top ten list, and a and a bunch that I don't know. Scientific Games Corp. Number one, Gaming Industries. S G M S. Bullish or bearish? Bullish or bearish? Bullish, 4.209 positive. Okay. I'm sorry, four, yeah, 4.209 positive with high volume. Someone in the chat room asked me about the significance of volume in social media, and abnormally positive volume is good for a signal. Abnormally low volume means that there is not a lot of strength to that particular signal. So let me, violin maker had that question. He always comes uh, up with good questions. Yeah, that was a good question. And that one has a high dispersion. That means there's a broad signal. So scientific gaming, number one, Leap Wireless, L-E-A-P, Wireless Communications 4.115. Now, I didn't have a chance to look this morning and see what was driving these. So one of the things, and I think we talk about this every week, is that this is a tool for your toolbox. So what I'll normally do myself is I'll go in and I'll look. If something is something that I don't recognize has a high S score and a high, high volume, I'll jump to a new site, see if there was an, see if there was an earnings play, see if there was you know, something along those lines too, or I'll even actually look at the tweets. They're normally the best barometer for what's breaking. Yeah, Leap, right. I think, though, is, is an AT&T buying Leap, so that's probably not going to move that much. No, that's probably going to gap open and stay there. Good, good example. Ann Inc., A-N-N, Apparel stores, 4.1 and big volume on that one, big abnormal volume on that one. Yeah, they had, so that's positive because we've been trying to figure this one out here in the pre-market. We were just looking at the spreads real wide here, reported earnings here this morning, and it's been 34 to 39. It's tightening here now. we got 34.80 to 35.10 here now. So it is tightening up, but you're saying it's positive. Oh, yeah, it's positive. And it, it's got abnormally high volume. The volume's been ticking up. Um, they're cutting a couple – they're – Cutting a hundred corporate jobs, or looking to consolidate profit. Um, I just bought a hundred shares just for you, John. Right <laughs> All right, just there you go. It ain't to win it. That's a lot. That's to watch it. <laughs> All right, so there we go. So, and Ulta, Ulta Salon and Cosmetics, U L T A, uh, is number four, and oh, that is positive nice. volume and positive. What's interesting is all the top S scores this morning have high volume which is normally you'll get a, a smattering of ones that have high S score with not a lot of volume. Hey, Joe, could uh, you pause on this one for a second? Yeah. Because this, uh, this one kind of has, oh, it's up six and a half bucks. Yeah, I had a oh, last night. Oh, man. So they so, that one's going to continue bell. today. Yeah, that Bucko 9 versus a Bucko 7, 868.19. Uh, so slight beat top, slight beat bottom. This is the one that had the whole debacle where it gapped down on the earnings report last time. And remember, they were breaking uh, that the, uh, the, the NASDAQ had let them that. in. on the. There were some market structure issues there where the closing print all of a sudden had that some traders were taking advantage of the news and getting in on the closing print. Remember that whole Nanix thing that, uh, that mm -hmm. Eric was breaking over there? So it's actually gapping the other way today. It's going back up five bucks. A uh, hundred okay. in a hundred in the pre market guys, and now we hundred uh, even hundred oh. even hundred on the kisser. It did that uh, just in that four to four fifteen bracket. Uh, pull back to the ninety six dollar level, get some nice consolidation there. Uh, but boy, oh boy, oh boy, because I was just looking at the daily chart and I was licking my chops here to see, you know, see this thing because you had multiple highs at uh, ninety one sixty, ninety one seventy, but 
See ya. Like, I'll put my bid there, wait for it to come back, but uh, I'm not chasing this puppy. Yeah, Ulta, ULTA, yeah, that's a good one. All right. So you get, there are times in social media, so one of the, someone asked me in the chat room yesterday, was, not yesterday, last weekend, it was a great question, and I've actually thought about it a number of times. What percentage of the time is social media acting on the news, and what percentage of the time is news that's already been released, and what percentage of the time is it, is it predictive? And it really, comes down, it really comes down to this. If you know what the news is, then it's probably reacting to the news. If, if you don't know, if you say what is going on there, then social media is, pro- is leading. So I, was, I saw a big story yesterday on CNN. And on the bottom of the CNN, it said, this story was originally broken on Twitter. So on days when there's an earnings report or a buyout, unless, unless you're watching our metrics real time, you're not going to see that break before it hits the news. And, and we have alert services and stuff like that that allow you to see that ahead of time. But there are a lot of times where if, if you know what the news is, and that's, what, and that's what's moving it. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Like, I can remember when Whitney Houston died, actually. I saw it coming across my Twitter feed, and I was like, oh, are you thinking, oh, this, is this right? I flip it on CNN, and CNN just has regular programming. I'm like, oh, that must be a bad rumor because CNN would be yeah. all over this. Literally two minutes later, breaking news. CNN comes in, Whitney Houston, you know, rumored to be dead. And I was like, holy cow, Twitter was like yeah. three, four minutes ahead of that. And they don't have to verify it. Like, people don't have to come in and verify That's stuff. the you know, key. Yep. There you go. That's the key for, for us active traders. You know, buy the rumor, sell the news. You know, so that's, the, that's why Twitter beats the news, because the news gets their news from Twitter. And then they go in and they verify it. Then they go in and they cross-check sources. That's why we're leading the market. And if you've got access to this stuff in real time like we do, it's a, it's a winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right. Um, how about some bearish TV. ones? How about or one more bullish one, then how about some bearish all ones? Right, did we, did I say, uh, all right. So last one, Vanda Pharmaceuticals. This one's an interesting one. been showing up a lot lately. VNDA. Wow, it's doing, and it's doing nothing pre-market here, but it was yeah. breaking out yesterday, man. So you're looking for a follow-through in this one. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's look at some of the negatives today. Um, all right, World Acceptance Corp, credit, Financial Credit Services, WRLD. Hmm. I don't know wow. any of these this morning. That was destroyed yesterday. I don't know what the deal was with that one either, but holy cow, that was $98 to $78. That's what you call if well, there you you go. this thing an ugly, ugly bloodbath. Do you remember <laughs> WorldCom, Dennis? It, it, maybe it's just the ticker symbol that's good. The name, World. You don't want anything to, you don't want to ever own anything yeah. that says World. <laughs> wow. So World. And, and this, is, this is just flatlined, guys. That, holy cow. That pe- Joe? We lost Joe. Joe Gitz. We're going to have to get Joe Young to bring Joe Gitz back on here. Uh, Joe was working from home today, so uh, perhaps uh, one of his kids uh, pulled the plug on him. But, uh, Dennis, look at this WRLD. I mean, this stock is just hang. Dennis, are you here? Uh, no, we lost Dennis, too. So it's the Joel and Brent show. Brent, let's look at this W. Let's take a gander. Yeah, let's take a look at this WRLD here. Bad day yesterday. I'm not sure what the news was associated I with it. I think they had earnings. Uh, was it earnings? Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Let's, let's see. Look Uh-oh, at... it's something far worse. What? In AK, last night they announced that they received a CID, also known as a Civil Investigative Demand, from the CFPB. That, that'll that definitely do it. Yeah, and could you want to explain all those acronyms? <laughs> the <laughs> Civil Investigative Demand? Yes. So they are going to potentially be re- receiving some civil charges wow. from the CFPB. Yeah. Not good, not, not good. Not good. Uh, let's just take a look at this. They even took it lower this morning. Uh, 76.08 was the low here. Uh, at, uh, 1300 here. We have gotten a bounce back up. One lucky share is traded at 8046. I guess with this kind of issue here, just keep an eye on yesterday's low here. We are trading above that at 7608. That'll be your support level. 
uh, that coincides with the low. That, nah, no, nothing coincides with that. Had another low back in uh, July at uh, 75.13. So maybe just uh, play the half and whole numbers on that one. And then was there, did Joe mention Revolution Lighting? Was that RVLT? Does that sound familiar? RVLT. I don't know. <laughs> There's a few he said he, he never heard of these. I wasn't sure, Joe, if you're out there in the chat. RVLT, was that one you were looking at earlier also? Uh, uh, let's take a look at this issue um, on the daily here. I uh, had a gap higher in the news a few days ago, and now we've come back in. Uh, for this stock, if you are trading uh, this issue, RLVT here, you're looking at a gap fill. Uh, you had some former highs. All right, I got, uh, see if I got Mighty Joe Young calling me here. Um, he's trying. He's trying. Seems like he's trying to call you. Computer. Hello. Hey. Hey, I'm back. We got me back. Let's go get Joe Getz. A little Skype crash. All right, I'll I'll, I'll get him. Hang on a sec. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Go go. That thing didn't that have some decent news yesterday? Go go. They had. They are the Wi-Fi pro Yeah, they had some news yesterday. Wasn't or maybe, it earnings? Maybe two days ago. Earnings. Earnings. And it wasn't decent. I think it was bad news. Ooh. It was actually yesterday Yesterday morning. They did report better than expected Q4 results. The guidance was in line, but that didn't do very much for the stock. Who was upgrading stock, that? Yeah. Someone was upgrading that earlier in the week, too. I remember that. Was it Morgan Stanley or somebody? Let's go check out the Benzinga Pro and find out. Go, go was... I don't mm. remember any rating changes. I do. I do. Yeah. Sure, I'll jump that up. I, I, I'll bet you. Oh, no, wait. Evercore. No, that was old. That's old. That's old. <laughs> you had I don't dream. see any. Joel, you dreamt about You had a dream no, about Go Go last night. That's crazy. <laughs> he was dreaming about Go Go. The Go Go. Go Go had a bad yeah. day here. Joel's favorite band. Yeah, the Go Go's, right? Uh, that <laughs> stock uh, closed near its low of the day 21.52 low, 21.99 closed. Uh, you have a gap fill there. Uh, trading lower here in the pre-market right at yesterday's low. So theoretically, you are opening in to support in this thing. Unfortunately, you take out this 2150 level. Not a lot of support here uh, in the issue. Uh, you do have an additional low at 2082. So are we having any luck getting Joe back or or not? We need Joe. Joe gets. We need Joe. Joe Young, is Joe Gitz coming? Uh, we got a pop, though, in the S&P status. People got a little... Buy the dippers. Buy the dippers. They're back again here. Uh, we did take out that low at, uh, what was yesterday's low? 34.50. One a ring. Morning, guys. Oh, How Joe are you? Gitz, Sorry. there he is. There he did, is. I, did I just connect you? I apologize, guys. No, I, I think the whole Skype call dropped because they lost me, too. So I think it the oh, whole thing okay. dropped. So. We're okay. back, we're back, and so, we were just right. going to get some bearish uh, stocks, so just yeah. as the market yeah. started to turn around and rally, what do you got that's looking bearish here this morning, Joe Getz? All right, <clears throat> I'm pulling it up right now, I was uh, I was looking at World, somebody was asking me about World, all right, um, so World world dropped yesterday, yesterday about 2 o'clock central time, and it just flatlined and stayed, fl and stayed flatlined, uh, HIBB, Hibbit Sports. Um, sporting Goods Services, negative four Escor, HIBB. Stocks trading down significantly here, too, this morning. We're down $2.59 right now. They reported earnings there this morning, $0.64 cents versus $0.70 cents and $217 yeah. million versus $221 million. That's a miss on the top and a miss on the bottom, and that equals a bad social media score, I guess, there, Joe. <laughs> That's exactly what that means. Z U M Z Zumez. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, negative four or negative four? A negative four. Um, like when you say anything over two is significant. So when yeah, you're getting a four, four, that's very significant. That is very significant. Z U M Z. And that's uh, that's what's interesting about social media is that you get stocks mentioned that you normally don't normally don't talk about. Um, 
Rock and Hilly, yes, we do publish index scores. The index scores are aggregates of the underlying securities. And we do publish those. Those are part of our, those are part of our uh, nightly, actually, our pre-market open flash report. Do you have anything in, on in the there. S&P 500 right now? Do you have anything on that? Yeah, let me go in and, let me go in and, and see what I got. I'm jumping. I'm jumping back and forth. All right. So we've had this big sell-off here, obviously, yesterday. And I think a lot of people are questioning whether we're going to follow through here with the sell-off or not. We got some support about 10 handles lower than we're trading some pretty major support. Wondering if we're going to test that here today or if the buy the dippers are going to come back in and uh, use this as another opportunity to just get long. You know, our current, our current S score is a 1.33, so it's not, it's not a 2, but there is positive bias there. Isn't there always a little bit of positive bias? What would be like the adjust for that? You're, you're right. There, there is a positive bias in social media in general, and you have to adjust for that. Uh, so we do, we do take into account the fact that there is a generally a positive bias in social media. So that, when we, when we, when I quote our scores, it's adjusted for any, for any okay. bias that we see in the data. So it's positive, but you got to remember, 1.33 is still within that middle range of the standard normal curve. Hey, so Joe, you see, you see Natalie's much. question in there about alerts. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, alerts? Is that the repor uh, report you're reading from? Well, I'm reading from our dashboard. And you can and – and thanks, Natalie, for that question because now I get to do a shameless plug. But you get to <laughs> – <laughs> it works. You can, you, can buy, you can buy our access to our services. Our flash report gets you access to what's called the dashboard. And the dashboard is what I'm reading from now. So I'm reading from the same front end that our subscribers get. The alerts allow you to enter a universe of securities that you're interested in, and we will notify you by private tweet, text, or email when your criteria are met. So it's a great way to optimize your use of social, me social media. There you go. That yeah. sounds like the way, because I, that's the way I've always liked to look at a basket of stocks and stuff, as opposed to, you know, following the news and, the, you know, the trends and stuff. That would be a, a very interesting, uh, you know, aspect of your service. Uh, Joe, just doing a little revisionist history here. We've had, you know, huge moves in these uh, fuel cell stocks. Uh, Plug, I guess, has been, you know, the leader. Uh, is Citron, is, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you want to disclose it or not, but is Citron, uh, you know, one of your contributors that, you know, that you follow, or are they just, uh, are they just too biased when they come out? You know what? Let me, let me look it up, because I don't have access to that. That is, pro that is the secret sauce in, sauce in the gold vault, but I will look it up, and I will uh, drop you guys a note. Okay, okay. Right. And what do you, what do you got, will, yeah, what do you, you, what do you got today? Says, I got? use just one. I use the alerts myself, so I put on more trades from the alerts than just about um, okay. any other component. Okay. And what do you got on plug today? All right. Traded down thirty-seven cents here in the pre-market uh, at uh, seven point six three. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, I imagine I love this level. We throw out a lot of levels on the show, but folks, I absolutely love this eight fifty level. Uh, 848 yesterday's high, that coincides with the 50% retracement. So uh, let's see if sellers step down from that, uh, that 848, 850 level. I'm pulling up. Okay. Maybe you need to get your six-year-old to help you out there a little bit. On I that. do my technology. Yeah. Uh -huh. Appar apparently, and mom is keeping them busy because they haven't, they haven't bothered me. Uh, just slightly negative on plug. Neutral is slightly negative. Slightly negative. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So let's let's jump on some of these. Let's jump on and see what else we got for your for the short side. All right. Uh, Aeropostel. We talked about Raptor Pharmaceuticals, healthcare, negative three and uh, four point one four nine on the volume. Okay, Joe. We got another question here popping yeah. in the chat here, and I, I just to close out the show here, we got to get another guest on in a minute. Just to address that question, and then uh, we can wrap up the segment. All right. Is it on the chat? Yeah, it says, uh, right. why should I care to pick up your info? Am I going to be able to beat out the institutions? I feel like they always have a jump on the market. The, our info will put you on equal footing with the institutions. And, and that's, a, that's a big thing that I believe personally is that the active trader needs the same information that the pros have. The pros have been using this for two years, and they've been beating the market with it. It, we're making that same information available to the active traders so they're not always 
sitting behind the hedge funds of the world. It's, that's why you get our information. And what so about Herbalife? Her I know I said to end the show. What about Herbalife? All right. Herbalife, that's always negative. But let me see. That's always negative. Always negative. Said that it what do you just follow Ackman. Bill Ackman? <laughs> oh, jinx. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, uh, that made a low yesterday. Hoo hoo hat fifty seven oh five I panic low fifty four fifty nine that's the one I'd be keeping an eye on here but uh, what kind of readings you get in the Ackman Icon battle? Uh, what's the symbol for HRB? Uh, that's HRB. I'm, looking, what, HLF. I'm sorry. What, that, which HLF. one did you want me to look up? HLF. 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 H, that's right. I put the wrong symbol. In. Herb is H and R block. Which actually and then block? tax okay. season here, so herbal or herbs always an interesting one when we're coming into tax season, but or we're in tax season. Uh, not get a whole lot on herbal life. So um, H and R block H R B. All right. All right. All right. Might as well talk about it. We're in tax season here. H R B's been actually pulling back here, so I guess if you're playing the seasonality on that, it hasn't been working here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, HRB2, while Joe's looking it up here, uh, made that low yesterday, 29.63. Had a low at 29.77, 29.40.48. So it coming into a little support here. It kind of looks like a little bit of, a little bit more than a 50% retracement here from that 28 low. So a little bit of support here for uh, for Herb. You got anything on it? You know what? I don't have anything on it. Okay, there we go. Here comes Herbal Life. Here comes Herbal Life. We're going back to Herbalife. And I've got, oh no, HR Block, I'm sorry. I've got, I'm having network issues. That's okay. Nobody Joe's working for Roblox. Yeah, we have, we, too, have so. those, we have those all the time, too. I, I guarantee I have a six year old playing Roblox upstairs. All right. Um, <laughs> six, uh, point six positive on HR Block. And if you, guys, if you guys want, I'll hang out in the chat room for a while. Okay. All right. Joe Gitz, uh, president of Social Media Analytics, giving us uh, the Twitter takes uh, from the market today. Thanks a lot, Joe. Stay in the All chat right, for a little bit. We'll talk to you next week. Socialmarketanalytics.com, okay? Okay. guys. Okay. Socialmarketanalytics.com. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thanks, one. Joe. Bye-bye. <laughs> The biggest thing this is just another tool in your toolbox. Like we said, it's all about having different tools and information. Like I've been a, a trading professionally here for 15 years, and obviously the more tools and the more information you have, um, that's critical, You know, if, especially if you're a shorter-term guy and a shorter-term trader. Information means everything. That's why we always try to give you a, a few of the imbalances here in the morning too because pros are using this information. They're looking at the morning imbalances and trying to gauge where these stocks are opening. Looking here just as, at the imbalances this morning got Bank America with a 235,000 share sell imbalance. The only one really jumping out uh, to me is that one. There's a few other ones, though, that have some sell imbalances, too. And I'm looking across the board, and I'm seeing a few more sell imbalances and buy imbalances here. So a little bit skewed negative here so far. Obviously, these numbers can change, though, as well. Also, Pfizer. I'm seeing a small sell imbalance in Pfizer. I'm seeing Wells Fargo with a 25,000 share sell imbalance. JP Morgan, 23,000 to sell. Morgan Stanley, 18,000 to sell. Citigroup, 21,000 to sell. Interesting enough, Goldman Sachs actually has a 16,000 to buy. So keep that in mind if you pair traders are out there today. If uh, Goldman Sachs opens a little higher and the other ones open weaker, sometimes there's some opportunities Is there 16K as well. Is 16K enough, uh, really, in, in that? 16,000? Yeah, on Goldman it is because you got to think it's a hundred and sixty dollars stock, so that's like a hundred and sixty thousand, you know, buy and balance for a sixteen dollars stock. So yeah, anything over ten thousand in Goldman can be significant. But we're very early here; we're still a half an hour away. I'll try to update the chat here if I see anything really jump out as we get closer. Obviously, as we approach the open nine twenty eight nine thirty, because these numbers continuously adjust until the stocks open after nine thirty. So. Um, those are always changing, but when you look at them, you know this is a pinpoint in time analysis here that I'm looking at these. So, um, but it's information here that is relevant to where these stocks are open, and the pros are using that information to gauge uh, where they're putting pre-market orders and where these stocks could potentially open. Okay, all right, we're gonna uh, take another quick break here, and we're gonna bring on a guest, uh, Brian Shannon of Alpha Trends. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Brian Shannon, founder of Alpha Trends. He's a full time trader, educator, author of the highly regarded book, Technical Analysis Using Multiple Time Frames. Brian, how are you doing this morning? Good. How are you? Good morning. Good, yeah, we're ready for some action today uh, in the markets. Uh, could you just give us a, a quick, uh, you know, your market and education background? My market education began uh, as a young boy sitting at my dad's side uh, trying to hang out with him watching Wall Street Week, and that was probably about uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> um, and I just kind of got interested in it from there. I did a couple of small trades early early on um, with money that I earned from various jobs, and, you know, caddy, newspaper routes, that sort of thing, and was really drawn to it. So right out of college, my first job was as a stockbroker, and um I did that for a few years, learned how to be a salesman more than uh, a stock guy. Uh, but it was, uh, and then I started with a company called Generic Trading in New York, which was one of those uh, companies that used to advertise in the, <clears throat> the back of the investor's business daily saying, you know, put up uh, 25000 we'll give you a 10 to 1 leverage. And yep, um, I remember from that. there, that's, that's, that's when I started full time. I've, you know, been doing various things, uh, but, you know, full trade, full time trading. Uh, over the last 20 years. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you're kind of up uh, in, in my age bracket there because I remember watching Wall Street Week with uh, Paul, what was it, Paul Lefevre, was that the guy's name? And uh, they would uh, have the different guests on and Joe Granville and stuff. So that, that that's funny. That goes back a long way. So, uh, so you yeah, been... it was... Go ahead. I'm sorry. It was Rick Kaiser that I used to watch. Oh, well, I don't remember Lefevre. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, there. Was, I'm thinking of another show there too. Then, uh, okay. So, what what markets do you focus on? Uh, equities, equities, and ETFs. So each day, I look at the uh, ETFs, such as the SPY, the Nasdaq, or the IWM, semiconductors, and financials and analyze those in, in videos for subscribers. And I like to have a general feel of what the market is, and I prefer to use the ETF because you can actually trade them versus looking at, like, SPX. Everyone talks about the levels there. But the, the spot, you can trade it. So, I, you know, I trade that, and we'll, we'll trade some of the levered funds based on uh, how they are setting up. Um, but mainly I prefer, you know, to... Uh, Bottoms up stock picking uh, based on technical analysis and looking at multiple time frames. So, are you are are you doing day trades, longer trades, or just a in longer term, or just a combination? Uh, kind of a combination. Nothing longer term. Uh, you know, my definition of long term is generally I, I can't remember the last time I held something for more than about two weeks. Okay. So what I what I strive to look for is a good swing trade setup. And then by using shorter term time frames to really fine tune that entry, I like to be fairly precise on the entries. And then um, oftentimes I will day trade those positions, uh, probably more often than not. And, you know, when I have a position that's working for me, then I'll hold a small piece of it for a uh, swing trade. So kind of a, a blend of day trading and swing trading. Okay, so you've been around the block a few times and you got started earlier in career. Uh, could you just share the most important uh, trading lesson that you learned early in your career? The most important stock trading lessons? Is that what you asked me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a dog in the background there. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing I think that a lot of people have issue with uh, is thinking that um, – you know, that the market's always going to come back and that they can buy the dips each time and not not being able to take losers, basically, taking that small loser before it turns into something bigger. We're, we're seeing a little bit of a correction right now in the market, and you know we never know if it's going to be the correction that uh, turns into the bear market. So we have to be cautious when the market starts pulling back and uh, wait for evidence that the buyers are actually showing up again. So I think a lot of people have created a lot of bad habits, uh, as they often do, in a bull market where they think, well, it's just another pullback, my stock, will, my stock will come back, and then they start getting into the cycle of trying to justify holding a losing position and add to it and then just really compounding the problem rather than dealing with a problem right away as soon as it pops up and, and taking a, a reasonable stop loss. 
Okay, cutting losses with uh, just a familiar trend that we talk about with a lot of traders on the show, um, as well as analysts. So you you look at your your technical guy, right? And your trades are based on the charts. Are you, you uh, a bar chart, a candlestick chart kind of guy? And what what time frames? You said you look at multiple time frames. You mind sharing uh, some of those time frames with us? Yeah. Good questions. Um, I have, I, I look at candlestick charts, not because I think there's any special magic to, to looking at the actual patterns. Um, I, I think that, you know, they're just more visually pleasing. And, and I had been a bar chart guy for, you know, a decade or so. And then as I gravitated towards doing a subscription service, people like the candles. So I gravitated towards that. Um, so candle versus bar, I, I don't think there's any real difference. You look at what is comfortable for you. And as a swing trader, the the uh, the main time frames I'm looking at, I want to be aware of what the tra- uh, time frame uh, trend is on a longer term time frame, such as a weekly chart, but it doesn't really play into my decision making. The decision making comes down to, and I'll make it kind of general, looking at a daily chart to say what's the primary trend and then what I'll drill down to an intraday time frame of either 65 minute or 30 minute candles uh, 65 minutes 65 minute where where just I'm curious uh, why you decide to use that time frame you figure everybody that's making their signals off the 60 minute chart is going to happen within 5 minutes and you're going to catch the lag or or what's the reason? No, for that? no, it's actually something much more, more sensible, not sinister than that. It's you know, if you look at the markets open from nine thirty to four o'clock each day, so we have thirteen uh, periods that are thirty minutes long. Okay, so if we're looking at thirty minute candles, then we have thirteen periods each day. If we look at hourly uh, candles, sixty minute candles, what you'll have is you'll have a candle that goes from nine thirty to ten. And then you'll have 10 to 11, 11 to 12, et cetera, through the end of the day. So you have seven candles representing a day, uh, but that first candle only represents 30 minutes of trading. So you're comparing apples and oranges. You have one orange on the open and you have six apples. So in order to, to uh, make it more precise, uh, the market is open, again, 390 minutes each day. So if you divide that by 65, you'll see that we have, or if you divide it by six, rather, then you get 65. So you have six okay. equal candles. So if you're putting moving averages on there, you're not, uh, or, or any indicator, you're comparing apples to apples, not uh, putting extra emphasis on that first 30 minutes uh, and overweighting it when it really doesn't uh, uh, deserve to have that extra weight. Okay. So that on those... Makes sense. With that... No, yeah. it makes sense. So, I didn't mean to be sinister on it, but uh, now you're breaking it down mathematically. It makes a lot of sense. No, no, it's uh, it, yeah, it's just it's just a mathematical, sensible thing. Compare apples to apples, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not the type of guy who says, well, if I look, if everyone was looking at a 10-day moving average, I'll look at a 90-day moving average uh, and get a head start on them. I I think that you know a lot of people try to do that and think that they're going to get some kind of leg up. But really the advantage comes from looking at multiple time frames and realizing that a moving average often acts as support. And why is that the case? Because a lot of times people will stop selling as the stock approaches that level, let's say a 50-day moving average. Other people will start covering shorts as it approaches a 50-day moving average. Sideline cash will come in and start bidding there. So you have less supply and you have more demand. And, and then what we need to do is to look at, so it might see a pullback, uh, going back to the original question, uh, to a 50-day moving average on a, on a daily chart or even a 20-day moving average or something like that. And then I'll look at a shorter-term time frame, such as the 30 or the 65-minute, and try to say, okay, here are the key levels. Does it look like it's building some support in here? And if it gets going to the upside, where does it have the potential to go? So I ask myself, where does it come from? And to, to determine, is it too extended to purchase it, or is it too early because the, the trend is still lower? And second question I, I look to answer is, where does it look like it has the potential to go before it's likely to encounter supply if we're, if we're trading long or, or some demand if we're trading short? And that's the basis of coming up with a risk-reward analysis. So I like to keep it objective like that and then start to say, okay, here are the key levels. I'll set a bunch of alerts on my uh, 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 real tech platform that I use, 
And I look to shorter term time frames. I'll go to a 10 minute time frame with a five day moving average. I think that uh, for swing trading, uh, the most important moving average you can look at is a five day moving average uh, for direction of the intermediate term trend. So I want to know where am I in relation to that? Uh, is it in what's the trend of that moving average? I want it to flat to, to heading higher. And then I'll drill down to shorter term time frames, even a one minute time frame to, to see uh, who has control for the day. Are we above or are we below a, a volume weighted average price for the day? I don't want to fight the trend for that day and the money flow for that day. So it's combining a lot of different moving averages to really kind of just pinpoint that entry so that I'm not exposing myself to too much risk first and foremost. Okay, got a question out of the chat room. If you're using the MACD, uh, what what settings do you use for um, for shorter time periods? Well, for number one, I don't use the MACD. Um, I have used it in the past, and, and, and I, anytime I do use it, I just use the default settings, which are nine, twenty-two, and thirteen, something like that. I'm not really—I I don't remember what they are, but uh, just the default settings. You don't have to change them for different time periods. Okay. All right. So walk us through the SPI. You don't pay attention to the uh, the S&P futures at all. You you concentrate on the on the SPY. Yes. I I just I you know for whatever reason I never had uh, success trading the E minis. Um, it's it's really kind of a quirky uh, psychological heavy thing uh, that that trading the futures just has never uh, been been something I've been good at. And, I, I, you know, I think that a lot of the stuff that occurs overnight um, tends to be mitigated the next day. Not always, but um, if I'm holding positions, then, you know, I, I, I want to be aware of what's the trend for my stock. I mean, a lot of times we'll have the market down and, and a certain stock will be up, and, and then the market doesn't matter. If you're picking stocks, the market, and, and you're doing a good objective job of doing that, the market itself doesn't matter so much. What I look at, though, is so, you know, if the market's giving me good long setups, then I'll, I'll say, well, what's the overall trend of the market? Does it, you know, does it uh, 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 fit in with what, what these stocks are saying? And then manage risk based on what I'm trading. I'm not interested in what the relationships are supposed to be. You know, the dollar's up, so gold's supposed to be down or right, whatever. Okay. If you're going to trade gold, trade gold. Um, because those relationships don't always exist, and people are just left scratching their heads. I think you have to manage the risk on whatever you're trading. And if we're in a downtrend in the S&P 500, and I see a good long setup, it'll tell me, well, just back off a little bit. Don't go as heavy. So I'll use that information uh, not to keep me out of the market, because I've done that, and it's cost me tremendous opportunity you know, by missing a good trade. Uh, instead, I'll, I'll adjust my position size to compensate for the greater market risk. Okay, could you just uh, just quickly kind of walk us through your, your your setups for today? What you're looking at? How you're approaching the market? Uh, big sell off yesterday. We did. Uh, I'm looking at the S and P futures. I uh, did take out uh, yesterday's low, kind of in a kind of scary area as far as supports concerned. Can you just quickly, you know, walk us through what you're looking at at the spider, and uh, you know, perhaps a potential trade for for our listeners? Yeah, definitely. I, well, first of all, we're we're below declining five-day moving average in the in the spy, the Russell, the Nasdaq, the financials, and the semiconductors, and those are the groups I look at. So I look at this market from an intermediate term standpoint as guilty till proven innocent. The market has to prove itself really to to look at it and say I have a good chance, good probability of of getting good long setups. But it doesn't mean I'm going to ignore any long setups. So two set of stocks that look like they could be Poise for upside would include uh, a company called Biomarin Pharmaceuticals, BMRN. And I think that that probably has to take out not just yesterday's high, but uh, the high from uh, Wednesday, which was about $79.30. But the the problem is here we are at $77.80. That's $1.50 higher. So I'm not sure there's going to be a good tight stop to keep at that point. At this point, I would say a stop goes... Uh, just under yesterday's low, because that's where we have a higher low at a five-day moving average, um, and that's at about 77. So 
Do I want to risk two and a half points? I'm not sure, but that's one I'm looking at. Another long setup would be Kamiko CCJ. Uh, this one broke out of a, a multi-year uh, base on the uh, weekly time frame by getting uh, above about 22 and a half. And it consolidated for about a week and a half and just started getting going again yesterday. So on this one, I think that you could probably buy this above about 25.20 with a stop of about 24.80 is the way it's looking right now. So a real tight stop. And uh, that, you know, those are the types of opportunities I'm looking for. So those are a couple long setups. Short side, a company called LKQ Corp. LKQ is the symbol. If you look at that daily chart, it's below the declining 10, 20, 50, 100, 150, 200 day moving average. So it's in a primary downtrend. And if you back it up to a weekly chart, you see that it had a massive run from 5 to 35. And now it's in the stage 4 decline. So, you know, the primary trend is lower. And it broke a little bit of support yesterday at about 27. And it looks like it could continue uh, lower from here with a stop probably about 27.50. I also, you know, interestingly, I think that Twitter, it's a tricky stock because it's pretty choppy and it's probably better for uh, day trades. But Twitter is kind of looking like it's hanging on the edge of a cliff here. Um, it, it's, it's, it is below its 10, 20, and 50-day moving average, and the 50-day moving average is declining. I think probably getting below about 53 uh, could send this back to test the lows for this year at about 40, about 50. Um, but we are below the volume-weighted average price since the company came public, and we've been trapped under that for the last month and a half. So that tells me that the average participant since the stock came public is actually losing money in this, and that's a good uh, barometer of the psychology, uh, I think, and, and the fact that we have it below declining moving averages says that, you know, near-term money is flowing out of this stock. So um, I'm looking at Twitter as a uh, potential short Navistar uh, also. So those are, you know, the, the types of ideas that I bring to my subscribers each day, and the, the emphasis is always uh, low risk. So I'll I'll say here, are, you know, these stocks are what I might consider official swing trades or watch list ideas. All the ideas for today are watch list ideas because I don't have a lot of confidence in the market. Even though we're in an intermediate term downtrend, the longer term trend is still real bullish. And, and, and this may be just another pullback. So we don't want to get too aggressively short when we're in a primary bull market because we've seen what happens uh, to people who do that. They get squeezed over and over and over again. So you and, let, and that you, pattern... I'm sorry. You, so you let, you let your charts dictate what you do. You don't, you don't have a, a stable of stocks that you file. You just have your setups. You look at your models and you could care less if it's AAA or BBB. If you get your technical setup in it, you're going into that trade. You could care less about the fundamentals. You could care less about the news. You're just going on, on your criteria. Is that correct? Pretty much now that, yeah. I do I do trade pretty aggressively Good. in Apple and Tesla weekly options. Uh, so those are the ones that I uh, have kind of my little junky trades in, and they're, they're you know, often quite profitable. I can, you see so many of these options double and triple in a day, on the weeklies in, in those two stocks. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in there. But generally, yes, uh, you know, one of the sites that I uh, manage is, is uh, onlypricepays.com. And that's something, a, a, a phrase I've been, I say over and over again, only price pays, because there's a tendency of people to really get distracted by the news and think that their opinion mat- matters. We saw, you know, maybe this Crimea thing is going to be nothing. Maybe it's going to be like Greece last year or nuke North Korea when they said they were going to send nukes our way uh, or any of the other, you know, big headlines that the market just ignored uh, in 2013 and continued to climb that wall of worry. So, only price pays, and if we pay too much, it's good. To, I, I like to know the the headlines of the news, but I don't want to know the you know the, read the full story and start to form my own opinions about what it means and what it means to the market. I'm not an expert news guy. I'm an expert at looking at price action and figuring out who's in control, buyers or sellers, and then controlling risk based around that. That's to me, that's the professional. Uh, way of trading and not being distracted by every little news that's headline. Good. That's a good way to, to trade. Uh, quickly, from the, uh, the, the, the Tesla and Apple options, are you 
uh, based on your technicals, you said you're trading the weeklies. Are you, do you see ridiculous premiums and, li- and ridiculous moves, and you're short now, just taking in that time decay? Or are you on the other side of things saying, hey, I think you know Tesla can go to 420 this week. Uh, I'm going to put on a put spread and see if it comes in. Or are you kind of out there just selling that premium and, uh, and taking that in, t- playing it from the short side? Uh, a lot of questions there, but I keep it simple, real simple. I don't do any spreads at all. I don't do any type of hedging. To me, hedging is just a, a, a way to minimize, uh, you know, to, it complicates the trade. Now you're talking about two legs of an option rather than uh, saying, I think I have an advantage here that I'm looking at. Uh, I know what the primary trend is. I know what the trend of the five-day moving average where we are in relation to the volume-weighted average price for the last couple of days and uh, looking at, at pivot levels and a lot of the other, you know, it's, it's pretty simple stuff, but it's price-based. And I, I try to uh, look just to, to buy puts and calls, straight directional. So I don't think there's massive premiums. What I look at is the, um, uh, the delta and say, I want to trade, uh, you know, I want to buy puts that are maybe uh, have a delta of 45 to 60 is generally what I'm trading. Now, on the last day, they tend to be, uh, you know, like, you know, deltas of 80 and 90. But it, it's, it, I, I, I think that those are where I do best. And they're typically slightly out of the money or just in the money uh, options. And it's, um, you know, you've got to be quick with them and you have to have confidence in your ability. It's not something that people should jump in and do is is day trade weekly options. It's, it's really, you know, I've been trading, you know, full time for 20 plus years. And, you know, I think back to your earlier question is what, what mistakes do I see people making? And I see people getting into a game that's beyond their ability. So they're going from the schoolyard shooting hoops with their buddies straight into the NBA game uh, which is the weekly options, yeah, okay. and they've got no business being there. Okay, that's that's excellent trips for tips for traders there. And uh, just uh, to close out this uh, very informative segment, um, any other tips for traders? Or if you want to talk about your site at all, uh, what what information uh, you you give out on that? Well, on alphatrends.net, I do a uh, weekly uh, video that I send out. You can sign up for, uh, there's a, a pop-up, annoying, one of those annoying pop-up boxes on my site uh, that will prompt you to get a swing trading guide, and then you're on the list to get that weekly uh, video. And for subscribers, I do a uh, daily video that looks at the market, and then another one where we look at these setups in depth, and, and I draw on the charts and show people exactly what's going on and what the logic behind the trade is and try to keep it as objective as possible. And by doing that for others, too, it helps me become a better trader because I'm being objective and I have to explain the, the, the logic and the reasoning behind a trade. So um, that's – and we have a chat room uh, that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot different than I think what a lot of other people are used to with chat rooms. I call them chatter rooms. We talk about prices and things that are going to help us make money, not about uh, some, you know, yeah. I've seen some of these chat rooms where people are just, you know, it's nonstop flow and you can't discern what's the important information. So um, you can sign up for a seven-day free trial and cancel if you don't like it. It's not for everyone, but uh, we look at swing and day trade uh, opportunities. Hey, uh, Brian. But I have the emphasis on education, too. I'm, I just wanted to get that in there. Okay, Brian, uh, thank you for your uh, very straightforward analysis. I think that's uh, you know, what Dennis and I talk about a lot is uh, you know the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, and uh, that's kind of the way you approach the markets and had success trading. Thanks a lot for coming on for this extended period of time, and uh, we'll let you get ready for the open, and we'd certainly like to have you on again. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. It was fun. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Okay, take care. Joe, are you going to be mad at me because I dipped into your morning headline segment? I just thought this guy was so good that we should keep him on. No, it's totally cool, man. You know, Alpha Trends is, uh, you know, he's got a great following on Twitter, too. You know, this guy is, he's no small operation. He's the real deal. Yeah, very, I liked his discipline, and I liked the way that he talked about the market, so... Via, via, violin maker, it's alphatrends.net.
www.alphatrends.net. www.alphatrends.net. So, Joe, let's get some uh, compacted headlines. Well, I was also going to say, Joel, I know when you like someone because you keep them on for almost three times as long <laughs> as they're scheduled for. So, basically, once it hits about the 925 mark and the guy's still on, I figure, well, I'll just shorten my headlines a little bit so we can talk Joe, about what's I going on. Joe, I did Skype open. you, though. I did Skype you and said, how long do you want me to keep him on? And oh, I, I know, I know. That, but I did that. It, uh, you know, it just wouldn't be a day here without some sort of technological issue like we had earlier so i wasn't even looking at skype i was trying to keep all my kittens in a box so hey just real quick guys that was alphatrends.net correct yes correct. okay i'm gonna drop a link there uh violin maker was asking for the link i'm gonna drop that in the chat all right thank you brent for doing that following up making sure everyone knows everything they need to know about mr brian shannon Moving into today's editorial headlines from around the globe, uh, perhaps you've heard about it, but an investigation into the disappearance of, Mo of a Malaysia Airlines jetliner is focusing more on a suspicion of foul play, as evidence suggests it was diverted hundreds of miles off course, sources familiar with the Malaysian probe said. In a far more detailed description of military radar plotting than, was, than has been publicly revealed, two sources told Reuters an unidentified aircraft that investigators suspect was missing. Flight MH370 appeared to be following a commonly used navigational route when it was last spotted early on Saturday northwest of Malaysia. That course, headed into the Andaman Sea and towards the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean, could only have been set deliberately, either by flying the Boeing 777 jet manually or by programming the autopilot. A third investigative source said inquiries were focusing more on the theory that someone who knew how to fly a plane deliberately diverted the flight hundreds of miles off its scheduled course from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Five people were stabbed to death Friday morning at a market in the capital of Hunan province in central China. Local media report that several ooh boy, Uyghur non-peddlers suddenly went on a knifing rampage after a disagreement among food stall owners escalated into violence. Police shot dead one of the knife-wielding assailants and arrested another, the AP reported. The killings recalled a Chinese massacre from earlier this month when 29 people were knifed to death and another 140 injured at a train station in southern China. Authorities quickly pinned the terrorist attack on Xinjiang separatist forces. In a number of popular accounts on the China, so much China news today. A number of popular accounts on the Chinese social media platform WeChat have reportedly been deleted. It's believed most of the high-profile accounts removed were known for publishing liberal political views. Media analysts say the move appears to be part of a crackdown by the Chinese government on the increasingly popular mobile, pla mobile chat application. Until now, WeChat had been free of any significant censorship. WeChat has more than 270 million users and is used primarily for private chat between friends, but it's also used by media outlets and individuals who can send one article to their followers each day. WeChat is quickly closing in on Weibo as the most popular social media platform of its kind in China. Mark Zuckerberg has been quite disappointed as NSA spying is exploiting internet to get private details of its users. The CEO and founder of the social network Facebook telephoned U.S. President Barack Obama to express his frustration over the U.S. government's surveillance program. The U.S. government should be the champion for the Internet, not a threat, Zuckerberg posted on his timeline. They need to be much more transparent about what they're doing, or otherwise people will believe the worst. The government is creating for all of our future, he also added. In other words, the Internet must be an opportunity for everyone rather than a gateway to intervene people's privacy. Let me see if there's anything else. Oh! Amazon Prime announced on its website that for the first time since it was introduced nine years ago, the price of Prime is going up. Next week, the premium membership will rise about $20 from $79.99. I thought it was just $79 a year to $99 a year. I also read that it wasn't taking place until January 2015. Was that disproven? Current subscribers will be notified of price changes when their membership is set to renew. The 25% increase is less of a price jump than Amazon hinted at during a quarterly earnings call in January. The company said that the price could have jumped by $40 or 50% of the original fee. Students with a .edu email address will pay $49 for an Amazon Prime membership. Amazon Prime allows users to get unlimited free two-day shipping on various purchases, as well as unlimited access to Prime Instant Video and the right to borrow books from Kindle's lending library. Brent, I think that we should change it over to benzingapro.edu so that we can save money on our Prime membership. What do you say? Uh, I don't think Prime's worth it, Joe. You don't? You must not be a subscriber, then. I am. 
Well, all right then. All right. That wraps it up for me. Just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, that the show would not be possible without our friends at Options House. That'll give you 150 commission-free trades just for signing up for an account through this page. There's buttons at the top at the bottom right. Click through, open an Options House account, get 150 commission-free trades and 20,000 Benzinga Pro bonus points just because you listen to Benzinga's pre-market prep. That wraps it up for Whose Lines It Anyway, where the where the games are made up and the points don't matter. I think Brenda's around here somewhere just itching to give us rating changes before the bell. Eh, Even can, though it's not before the bell anymore. Yeah, Whoops. we kind of we we kinda kinda opened. And yeah. we kind of opened higher. We did gap. Yeah, 1839.75. Just before the open, we were trading around 1836. So we did get about a three or four point boost there right at the open. Any ideas on that move, Joel? Uh, just taking a look here, I'm just trying to see what is moving and a shaking here. And uh, just quickly going into the S&Ps here. Let's just keep an eye on the settlement price of 18 39.75. We nicked that puppy here just a few seconds ago. That's going to be your first area of control in the S&P 500 to close. Let's see if we can get above that. Uh, let's take a look at some of the stocks uh, that we had some earnings news on. Uh, starting with Ann Taylor, and Ann Taylor is not doing too good this morning. Uh, they had it down in the pre-market, uh, or excuse me, I'm, I get all these mi mixed up. ARO is the one I want ah, to talk about ah. here. Well, uh, Ann did have earnings too, that's why he might have been confused. Get all these uh, teen retailers mixed up, but uh, that made a low uh, just now near the $6 level. I just want to alert our traders uh, that you had a low at 604 back on February 14th we've had a low at 607 in the session uh, potential support for ARO and we'll skip right to that one here as well uh, I don't know where Dennis bought it but uh, 3486 is the high open there had a quick dip down to the $34 level we did talk about that area as potential support because you did have a a double bottom at 33.96 and 34 even. So we'll have to find out from Dennis um, how he did on that one. Uh, and then let's what else? We talked a lot about GM today, didn't we? We definitely did, and we didn't really talk about Ford. I kind of wanted to highlight Ford okay. shares down uh, about two percent, while over the same course GM's down about ten percent. I think that was going back maybe two weeks or so on the chart. Ford really holding up here amid the GM concerns. Okay, it's uh, we have taken out yesterday's low, opened up 33.85. Uh, 34 seems to be the level of control here now. Uh, just made a 33.70 low, currently trading right at that level. I just want to alert our traders. You had the pre-market low at 33.20, so that's uh, that's the only level that uh, you have for you. Um, Joel, I got I got a good one for you. It's not quite to the obscure stock that Jake usually brings on, but I do like to look at this sector. Mattress Firm had earnings last night. Strong Q4 report and also raised the fiscal year guidance. The ticker on Mattress Firm is Mike, Foxtrot, Romeo, Mike, MFRM, and these stocks, uh, the mattress, mat mattress stock, Select Comfort, also Sealy, they trade pretty closely they together. Do. They do. Okay, so mattress firm here. Bob, taking a look. M M F R M. Okay, I got it up here on the up piece. about four and a half percent right now, or so about two bucks. Okay, let's take a look at it here. M F R M R N, right? Oh, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Mike Rom Mike Faxa, Romeo Mike. Gap go forty six twenty six. You gapped open higher. Uh, got up to forty seven. 30. There's really not a lot up here. This is uh, uh, hasn't been up at this level. It was up at 46.85 uh, back in July. So keeping an eye on that early morning high at 47.50. Kind of in uh, uncharted waters. Uh, I believe the all-time high for the issue is up at 48.18. So we'll keep an eye on that one. Uh, we are just looking here. Uh, BIO uh, DJ's taking a look at here, getting hit again. The old two-day sell-off here. 
Look at this uh, Bio Red Lavatories. That would be the Class A stock here. I think I think DJ is saying Biotech getting hit again. Take a look at Gilead. Maybe? Oh, I think he is. Yeah. And I thought he said BIO. Well, that hit. is a ticker. So. And then I'm looking and I'm like, uh, getting hit again. Gilead. And I, th I thought it was like a comma. And talk about gold breaking out here. Uh, above, uh, <laughs> boy, I, I need to get my glasses. Uh, I need to read my Latin. Bifocals. Uh, yeah, I do. I need to get those going. But uh, let's take a look at Gilead. Uh, that is a Momo stock uh, that we haven't looked at. In a long time, has come down. I know Joe's not happy about this one. He is a big owner in the company. Here he has to file every time he sells shares. 13D uh, filing yeah. from Joe Young. I saw him out. fill that out the other day. Uh, 75.85 pre or is the low you've hit in the session. That coincides 75.70 low that you had on February 7th. Then you had another stink a low, a little bit below that 75.30. So... By the dippers, you're going to have to hold, see the 75.30 to 75.80 uh, uh, range hold up. But uh, gap down and uh, still heading lower as we speak. The close is 78.01. If you do manage rally, um, expect resistance at that level as well. Uh, okay, GM's continuing lower. We had talked about the you know spotty support that you had on that with the negative news. Like, who really cares if they're liable or not, right? It all depends on what the market is saying. The market is saying they don't like this news. We're keeping an eye on the pre-market low at 33.20. Uh, Aeropostel just trying to bust out of this $6 level. Hit 607. Just not getting a little bit of a bounce. Look like some people bringing in some shorts there. Uh, an interesting call by Joe here, and he had this um, SGMS. Scientific Games. Yeah, and he had this, and this was actually, now this is, I, if I did play this uh, Twitter sphere kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing would, you know, if I could get a stock that has a positive alpha or whatever positive rating, and I could get a chance to pick it up, you know, a little bit lower, then, you know, then that's kind of the way I'd like to play it, and being a contrarian that I am. And uh, that certainly, uh, it opened uh, 1605, and that was right on the low. That was $0.08 cents from the close, and then you got a quick pop up to 1650, kind of just hanging out mid-range there. 17 and a quarter yesterday's high. Uh, it's got a little ways to go from, uh, from that level. Joel, I got one more I want to cover before Jake takes over here. Green Mountain is getting some action this morning. Hit. A low just under 105 at 104.94, and now we are almost up to 110. They did announce this morning an amended deal with Starbucks. Starbucks is going to be getting wider coverage of the K Cups. So we do have Starbucks shares did pop at the open, but we're kind of flat now in Starbucks. But Green Mountain shares trading up pretty nicely this morning at the open. Uh, yeah, dip and rip. Uh, well, I actually did open higher as well. Just alert our traders, this 110.41 was yesterday's high. So you do have potential resistance at another 40 cents. Well, good morning, Joel. Figure I'll hop on the show at this point. Uh, it's 9.40, maybe time oh, for... Man. We got to another... get Jake on here sooner. What's going <laughs> on with that headphone? This one? No, the one that we were supposed to Oh, uh, still working on it, actually. Uh, so there's one more piece that we have to order to connect it all the way from my side of the desk. All so right. So we'll hopefully get that set up. So first, uh, obscure stock is uh, MSUBB, Michigan State University Basketball, uh, playing tonight. He got me on that one. <laughs> Uh, I, knew, I knew you'd think it was an OTC stock. I was going <laughs> to say MSU, and I was like, it actually probably is a ticker, so I was like, oh, let's add the BB. But... Um, so, but aside from that, uh, we do have some big names moving this morning. Uh, GM really taking a hit on this news. What do you make of this news? I mean, are they are they are they liable? Or are they not liable? They, I mean, come I on. would have to think that they're they're gonna be liable. I, how would they not be? I, I mean, I I I, I want to think that they're not because I think this is this is gonna be a huge hit for GM. It's really smacking them around, and um, you know, they're saying this is a, a, a test for the new CEO. I just, I mean. I think it's a little bit more than a test. This this could be a disaster. It's not going to obviously destroy the company or anything like that. But this is going to be very, very, very costly. And you know, it really reminds me of the uh, the problems Ford had, had with the, uh, the 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 Ford Explorer, or as a lot of people like to call it, the Ford Exploder. Uh, way back was it 
late 90s and then the 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 firestone tires where they're the you know the insta shred tires or whatever people wanted to call them but uh that huge huge fiasco i mean it seems like this is what it's kind of shaping up to be for uh gm yeah it uh then price don't lie here taking it down to 3357 uh from a 3394 high so we are, if you're looking for a rebound on this, uh, we've had about a 40 cent range, just about. So uh, it's called uh, 33.77 here, that point of control here. Hold that, get a chance to go back up to the $34 level. If not, uh, I, I think I said 33.20 was the pre-market low. For sure. Another uh, one moving to the downside is actually U.S. Steel, ticker X. Uh, company caught a downgrade from Credit Suisse. And I mean, this is a lot of the steel names have been having trouble, but um, we combine this Credit Suisse downgrade, which basically is focusing on the second half of the year, saying that you know um, there's uh, going to be weakening uh, price price action for uh, iron ore, and I mean that that, that caused quite a sell off in the pre market. You combine that with the the market weakness as a whole, and it was down as much as uh, 4.3 percent, I think. So, uh, what do you what do you think on U.S. Steel's chart? Uh, U.S. Steel uh, made a low here, 23.74. That was right off the hop, right? You know, so uh, people selling off the open, 70 cent lower open, 23.74. That was the exact low. If you were looking on your charts and going back to March 3rd, you would have noticed a 23.77 low. Uh, so the, the nice, nice formation there. Uh, trying to fill the gap at yesterday's low, 24.15, 24.17. Um, if, in fact, uh, you can clear that level, uh, take a look at the close at 24.40. Another one moving to the downside is General Mills. Uh, GIS, Golf India Sandy, for anyone following along on their own charts. At the 7 o'clock rush this morning, the company did release some guidance reaffirming its fiscal year 2014 guidance, but definitely lowered its third quarter 2014 guidance, which is the coming quarter. So uh, that really caused shares to take a hit this morning. Uh, you know, traders are really not too happy about that. You know, it's going to put a lot of pressure on its uh, on its fourth quarter to make to make up the numbers. And uh, who is that again? I'm sorry, General Mills. GIS. Oh yeah, we just yes, you know, that's funny. You're reading my mind here because that was one we were talking a lot about in the pre-market here and uh, actually uh, even a blind squirrel can find an acorn every once in a while because uh, we had looked at the pre-market low at 49.51 okay that or actually 49.36 I identified that as a potential support point because you did have some lows in that area if you were buying this off the open you got the low print even Dennis could take the heat you know the uh, the, the hit on that because uh, 49.56 was the exact low. Uh, you popped up to 50 in a Q, uh, 50 in a quarter. Still have another 50 cents to go to fill the gap. So the run may be over, but there was a nice pop off the open in General Mills. Well, that kind of closes up the bigger names that I had. Um on the upside, for a little while, we had some strength in Amazon uh, after uh, you know releasing the the increased pricing for Amazon Prime, and you know I think the the chatter was at least by the pundits that oh Amazon finally cares about making money now, like they didn't before. But uh, I guess bumping up prices, it, it was nine years before they had actually increased the price of Amazon Prime whatsoever. Uh, you know they sent out an email saying it's been around for nine years. Yeah, I know. Isn't that incredible? Are you crazy? I had it. Uh, I had it when I was, a, I guess, a junior in college. So I was thinking, oh, okay, that was a little while ago. Well, I guess that was, you know, like you know, five, six years ago <laughs> now. So it was a little bit longer ago than I thought it was, or than I fancy it was, at least. Um, but you know, it's it, it's incredible because you know, obviously, transportation costs, fuel costs, you know, all uh, weight, even wage costs, just with inflation in general, have gone up. And uh, you know, Amazon hasn't touched the price, so they're adjusting it now to ninety nine bucks uh, for Prime, and uh, you know now you know users have to figure out whether or not that's worth it to them but uh yeah getting a pop i think i think lisa signed up for that if i'm not mistaken i don't know why but uh we did a gap fill yesterday made yesterday's high at uh 38311 and if you go to the charts uh you still got a gap fill to go up to 38770 so getting a little bit of a lift uh uh you know moving up higher hard to trade these 400 dollar stocks don't have a big opinion on them but uh, we're running over here. It's nine four five, uh, two hours and fifteen minutes of the Michigan basketball game. Uh, <laughs> if anybody's paying attention to that, but uh, 
We've had a great week on the show, some great guests. Uh, thanks to everybody in the room for your feedback. Uh, it's what's important to you guys. This is what's important to us. And uh, we'll be back with you on Monday. Have a good weekend.